Coach Well, thank you so much for your time. I know you're a really busy man. Uh, I've been following your work for first day I start coaching. Actually, I've uh, been going through this Bible here. <laughs> and thank you for all the podcasts you've been doing because uh, they're gems. And actually having you, it's actually having you one-on-one, uh, the podcast, the videos, everything. Uh, they're so helpful. And thank you for all the work you've been doing. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I, I like doing these. I really Podcasting is, like I said, it, it's the, the way to... Easy way to reach the world. It is because uh, it's actually, as I said, it's like having Mike Boyle in my, when I go out for a walk, I've got Mike Boyle talking to me. It's amazing. And back in the days, like 10 years, 20 years when I first started, like we had to travel wherever you were or whoever you were trying to learn from to be one-on-one in the place that we're flying into. Um, who's Mike Boyle? And then I'll ask you who's coach Mike Boyle. Well, yeah, Mike Boyle is a guy who lives in Reading, Massachusetts and has two kids that play hockey and a son that plays hockey and lacrosse and, you know, he goes to games and hangs out with parents on the sidelines and tries to be as normal as he possibly can be. That's cool. Bless. God bless for your kids and your family. Coach Mike Boyle. Who's Coach Boyle? You know, Coach Mike Boyle is, is different. I mean, he's, I guess he's a, you know, an educator and a writer and a coach and a podcast guest and lots of other things. And it's very, very different. It's funny because I always laugh in the town that I live in, the vast majority of the people that I know have no idea what I do. And they're like, oh, he owns, you know, he owns a gym. And yeah. people are very surprised sometimes when they come into the gym and see the size of the gym. They come in and they're like, we thought you owned a little gym. You know, and we have like 22,000 square feet in one of our facilities. So it's, it's interesting. And I, I like that. I like the fact that we can sort of have a, a you know, a relative level of anonymity. People are always su- surprised when they think like, you wrote a book? You know what I mean? It's just all these things because we do, to some degree at least, try to keep it separate and the, the coach Mike Boyle is you know someone who has to go to work every day and coach and someone who has to spend a couple hours every day doing stuff like this you know I always think I have to do these these things that are necessary to maintain a certain position within the industry and that's you know sure. writing and being a podcast guest and recording lectures and doing all this other stuff you've been a coach for 40 years Yep, just about. I think 39. So, yeah. 39 years. In your 39 years, now that you're up top and you can see things, you know, from that high up, what are the basic fundamentals for a coach, for a strength conditioning coach? Yeah, you would like to see someone that's coaching uh, you, actually. So, it's funny. I wrote an article about um, becoming a CNP, certified nice person. I think the fundamental thing is that I always say you need to be a person that other people want to be around. We, unfortunately, live in an area fitness, whatever, strength and conditioning that is just overcome with ego because there's so many people who go into fitness or strength and conditioning or whatever we want to call it because they like to work out, because they want it to look better, because they want it to be stronger. For a long time, that was the vast majority of people that were out doing the teaching and doing the writing. And those were the people that you saw. And a lot of times these weren't necessarily nice people. They just were smart people who were in good shape. And now... I think what we're looking at is I think we've got a a next generation of people who are maybe smart people and they may be in good shape. I always kind of joke, like, if you look at me, I'm not anybody you'd take. No one would ever take exercise advice from me if they didn't know me. So it's just a it's a different world. And I think we're we're slowly overcoming the ego. Look at me part. Like I tell people all the time, if you're if you came to apply for a job and you said, oh, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm a power lifter or I'm an Olympic lifter. In the past, those would have been really strong pluses on your side of the requirements. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the ledger. Now I look at those and I see them as negatives. You know, when I see someone who's an adult and is like, oh, I'm really into bodybuilding or I'm really into powerlifting, or, I'm really into Olympic lifting, I'm like, gee, are you going to be really into coaching? You know, are you really going to want to spend the time? Because I've seen too many people who the number one thing that day is their workout. And then they may help five or six other people work out during the course of that day to make enough money so they can keep getting their workouts in. And so I think that's sort of, I guess that's the big changes in the industry to me. Do you think we went from a meathead to all about science to, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I just did so many courses, which I didn't understand what I'm doing, but I need a job. Yeah. I mean, I think we went from, you know, I think we went from, some areas went from meathead. Some areas are still stuck. Yeah. In meathead. <laughs> there, there's still a lot of meatheads out there who are still into the you know it's all about how much you can lift go heavier or go home and i always say the go heavier or go home people are all getting old now and they're all there's more and more of them talking about the era of their ways like oh wow 
I wish I'd been smarter when I was younger because now, you know, I have this back pain that won't go away. Or I have to get a shoulder replacement. I have to get a hip replacement. And I'm sorry that I told everybody, oh, go heavy or go home. Or, you know, you're a baby if you don't do this. Yeah. And I think we've moved, not necessarily all about science, but I think it's clearly become more intelligent. And you read my book. And I said that in the book, like for me, the big influences for me in the last 20 years were much more physical therapists and people like that than they were other strength and conditioning coaches. Because I found I was learning much more from, like I said, from the Stuart McGill's of the world or from the PTs. Like, okay, how can I make this safe and effective, which is really what I want to do. It's yes, not yeah. enough for it to be just effective. Effective is great. I'm all for effective. I, you know, I, I want my programs to be effective. But what I really want is for my programs to be safe and effective. I want to be able to, like I even look at myself and think 39 years in this thing and what do I get to show for it? Eh, a little neck pain, a little shoulder pain, a little back pain, a little knee pain. You know what I mean? And I'm very functional for 60. Oh, I God, yeah. it, but I don't, I mean, I don't lift weights. You know, the, the, I mean, I, last time I lift, like seriously lifted a weight was clearly in the 1980s. And I still train. I still will use weights, but I mean, of, and body weight a lot. I've seen you yeah, body weight, but a lot of pulley stuff, a lot of, you know, not machines, but I mean, you know, I use our Kaiser equipment You know, I'll be doing body weight squats and one leg squats and split squats. But I think we, we've made a lot of mistakes in what we advocated for people to do over time. And then there's a lot of people who still don't want to admit that it was a mistake and look, yeah, at yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, hey, sorry, I, you know, I should have, I, you know, the stuff I told you to do when you were 20, hey, that stuff, it, you know, it ended up being wrong. <laughs> you know, I could have told you to do a lot of things that were probably going to be, again, maybe, maybe a little bit less effective, but a lot safer and a lot more, a lot more conducive to living a long and healthy life, which. Congru congruent. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm seeing the effects now in my generation, because think about this. I'm the first generation of kind of strength coaches and personal trainers and people like that, that are going to retire at some point. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've basically only had one kind of generational lifespan. And so you get all of these people who, oh, I know this, I know this. And I'm like, you don't know anything because you haven't, you know, I wrote an article called training an athlete for 17 years. Cause I had a couple of our hockey players who I trained for 17 consecutive years through their college career, through their NHL career until the time they retired. Wow. And, and it's really easy when they're 18. You know, everybody can squat and everybody can clean. And everybody can do everything. And, you know, every year, you know, the, the car gets a few more miles on it. And every year there's something that, hey, you know, I can't, I hurt my shoulder. You know, I can't clean anymore. You know, I hurt my wrist. I have trouble holding the bar in that position. And then you find yourself in this world of functional training, quote unquote, like you said, you know, body weight stuff. And it's not really body weight stuff because, you know, we're loading body weight, but it's, you know, a lot more joint friendly training. We're going to come up with ideas that are much more joint friendly, things that are going to, you know, treat your back better and your neck better and your knees better. And, you know, there's going to be none of this go heavy or go home. It's going to be get ready to go back and, uh, and play another year because that's ultimately what it's really about. You know, when you've got professional athletes, you want to get them able to go back to work effectively. And so now when I look at our, our amateur clients, I look at them and say, hey, um, you know, I want you to be able to go to work every day. I want to make your life. I look at people and think, I want to make your life better. Better, yeah. I want you to get up in the morning and feel better than you did before. As opposed and that's the actual to, functionality we, in training. Yeah, we went through the CrossFit kind of generation, you know, of people yeah. where, it's like, you know, you're killing people and wiping people out. Or people, you know, you know, hands are bleeding and shins are bleeding and they're laying in puke. And you're like saying, hey, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that was really good for you. It's like, <laughs> No, that's probably not really good for you uh, and probably actually really bad for you. And yeah. so I think, you know, looking at it and thinking it has to be hard enough to be beneficial. Yeah. And not so hard to, as to be disruptive to your day to day living. But it's also it's like I've got my uh, motto here. Like, I think that that's a cardinal rule of training consistency. That's what I always say. And we forget about that because, you know, you, you train people. You said you were training a person for 17 years. That means a lot. Like for people can understand, it means like that's amazing because people nowadays are like, oh, four weeks of a cycle of a training program is like, oh, what are we going to do now? It's like, uh, well, we're just starting to get into the proper training because we're assessing you. We're seeing how you moved. We see how you feel. And then we can see if we can start loading like physiology 101. And now people want, oh, what can I do to be uh, uh, leaner, faster or be faster now or perform better now 
like not about keeping a regime for like a long period of time. I have one personal training client left and I've trained this guy, I've trained him for 20 years. He's a doctor, he's a 70 year old doctor. And he complains, you know, I've gotten weaker. And I'm like, of course you've gotten weaker. You were like in your forties when we started. You know, you're <laughs> wow. nine years, now you're 70 and you're mad because you can't bench, you know, get as many reps at 135 as you used to be able to get. And I said, but you work every day and you feel better than you felt 10 years ago in terms of, you know, we've, we've cured your neck pain and your back pain and your shoulder pain and all these other pains that you have. And, you know, and you're, what you're mad about is, you know, that your maxes have gone down. And I think a big part of that is us educating our clients. Like if you're going to go with the, the four week quick fix kind of work style, then exactly. yeah, you I mean, you know, then you can live in that stuff. But you know, yeah. we look at it and think, I always tell people, um, you know, we, we really are, we're in the life changing business. That's the way I look at my business, particularly with our adult clients, and even with our kids to some degree, but mm -hmm. we want to change your life for the better. We want your life to be more positive. We want you to feel better. Yeah. I want you to look better, but I would, I would absolutely say that looking better is clearly carried to feeling better. Like some people might come in and be like, you know, I came into your gym 10 years ago. That client looks exactly the same as they did 10 years ago. And I'm like, yeah, that's unbelievable, right? Zero deterioration. They look exactly the way they did 10 years ago. And yeah. so people <laughs> look at that and see that as a positive. I look at that and see that as a huge positive. If I can delay the onset of aging, yeah. then I'm really doing a, a good job. If I can make old people look younger physically and old people move younger, you know, move like younger people, that's the really positive things that we're doing. Are you kidding me? That's the essence of our, uh, of our job, I think. Uh, well, yeah, I think you and I both think that. So it's different. Uh, I think other people view it differently. Like I just kind of laugh at people when they talk about like, whatever, how much weight somebody lifts or some of these things. And I just like, who cares? I mean, does anybody really like, does any normal, rational adult, I always say, if you're an adult and you have conversations about how much weight you can lift, you've got problems. Problems. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be having conversations with people about like, you know, what you're, you know, you know if you have to bench go to a party and talk about what you bench. There's a problem. There's a real problem. What would you say to uh, Mike Boyle when he just started being a coach? That's that's what I want to learn from you. As uh, I've been doing it for twenty years, and I think I'm uh, like a, still a baby, and I always want to be a baby. But I'm trying to be better and better. Like even now, I'm training uh, pro athletes in MMA and tennis. And every time, I'm like, oh, I need to learn more. I need to do this. I go back to your books. I go back to the strength conditioning rules. And first of all, you need to listen. But when you need to perform, um, I always want to know what would you do. You know, I would just tell people all the things that I tell our staff, you know, simple stuff like, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Just realize that it is ultimately a people business and that at the end of this whole thing, it will be a people business. And what will matter are your people's skills in terms of, you know, do you get referrals? Do you get more people coming? Do you get people coming back? If I really care about you getting better, like if I care about you as a person, whatever, you know, you said could be MMA, could be tennis, whatever it is. If I care about you as a person getting better and I really execute my knowledge to the best of my abilities, you're going to go and tell all your friends that. And you're going to say, yeah. this guy really cares about me. It's really important to this guy that I do well. And yeah. I think it's so much less, I think, you know, people spend so much time nerding out on, you know, reading about periodization and, you know, whatever, triphasic training and all these things. And it's like, trust me, most of that stuff is going to matter very, very little. I have. I always tell people, I have some of the best athletes in the world in a lot of sports, a lot of different activities. And when I look at how often we would be doing things that I would see like super advanced training technique is I'd be like practically none of the time. Do you know what I mean? So such a small percentage of the time. And most of the time it's really basic. It's okay. You know, trying to get them healthy, trying to get them ready, trying to figure out, you know, because they're, they, they're not a 52 week a year fitness person. Mm -hmm. I think two week a year fitness person is a little harder. Because you've got to, there's some entertainment that comes in there, you know, in terms of you've got to keep that person interested year round so they keep coming back. Whereas with your kind of higher level, quote unquote, population, the other thing I would tell you, I'm sorry, because I just thought about this, you know, don't think you're a good coach because you can coach good athletes. I always think you, oh, know, you can, you can teach, no, no, no. teach a monkey to coach good athletes. It's coaching bad athletes that's where you learn and where you kind of get the most, you get the most benefit. I, I laugh because, you know, we have some, some really elite people. 
and all you have to do is show them what to do. I mean, all, I'm, I'm the organizer. Like, you have dear consistency. I'm dear consistency. You know, please, I need you to show up four times a week. I need you to do exactly what I say in the order that I say it, the way that I say it. And if you do that, you're going to come out the other end 12 weeks later really, really good. If you miss workouts, if you're inconsistent, if you don't do what I say, you're going to have problems. It's not it is a very uncomplicated process that we, I think sometimes we go through a lot of kind of mental gymnastics to make ourselves feel much more important. And I've told coaches a lot of times, I think people program for themselves more than for the athletes. Yeah. You know, they're bored. Oh, we yeah. do thing all the time. You know, we're going to do something different as opposed to the athletes or the clients being bored and we're going to do something different. That's really interesting what you said, because, you know, we, that goes to us. Who would be your coach? Or who was your coach? Because you get, you know, you get uh, many times at a point that you're like, I'm out. I have nothing to give to me because you've been taking decisions all day. You know, you've been the master for the family, for your athletes, for your gym. And then you, there are things you need to do for yourself. Did you ever have a coach or do you have a coach? Nope. I mean, I've really, I mean, I've had really good mentors. I've been very, very lucky. So I went to college at Springfield College and it was a physical education school. And I had some really, really good teachers at that physical education school. My dorm director uh, for the first two years that I was there was a guy who ended up, he's the longest tenured strength coach in the National Football League. So in our NFL, he's been, you know, he just retired this year at like 64 years old. Mm -hmm. He was my dorm director. So I was exposed to some people very early on. Uh, his name was Mike Wojcik, by the way, who were really sharp. And then I went around and, you know, I, I always was lucky in terms of I was curious and yeah. curious led me to people. So I remember probably when I was 40, about 20 years ago, one of our interns uh, came and was raving about what was then the International Performance Institute. Okay. And, and I got uh, he brought me a magazine article. And there was a picture of Mark Verstegen. And actually, if strangely enough, it was Mark standing on the stability ball, if you've ever wow. seen the picture. But yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's a 30 year old, you know, Mark, flat top, pumped up, standing on a stability ball, you know, and it's one of these articles about how, you know, Mark Verstegen's making athletes down in South Florida. And I remember thinking, I'm going to go out and meet this guy. And the guy that was in the pictures was a guy named Daryl Leto, who was also a great strength and conditioning coach, was with the Houston Rockets for a while, and now I think is back at, um, He's back at Exos with the Altus guys. But I knew Daryl a little bit from his Arizona State days. And he was down also at uh, International Performance Institute. So what, what became Exos? These guys were the original Exos guys. And I, I called Daryl up and said, hey, we're going to take a little vacation. And maybe we'll come over and watch some workouts. And I said, I'm hopefully I'll get a chance to meet Mark. And he was like, oh, you know, Mark's really busy. Got a lot going on. Not sure how that's going to work out. We went down and ended up having a great meeting. I spent basically the whole day with him. I think I spent four hours the first day just with Mark going over the plans for Exos. He's showing me his drawings and his blueprints. And then it was, it was athlete's performance at that time. It was like, this is where it's going to be. But like for me, he was 30. I was 40 at that time. But I remember meeting him and thinking, wow, this guy's really sharp. And I, you know, we've become, we've been friends for 20 years. But I think with him, I wasn't afraid to look at a younger guy and think, wow, here's a smart young guy who's doing some things better than we are. I, I wasn't, no. you know what I mean? I wasn't the least bit offended by that. It was more like, hey, I got to spend more time with this guy and figure out, you know, kind of why is he doing what he's, you know, it, what's he doing? Why is, why is his thought process the way that it is? What um, intrigued you mo most of that? I would say, well, one, they had been doing a lot of tennis and baseball. Yeah. So they were much more into sort of lateral movement, multi-directional movement and um, rotational power probably than we were. Those were the two things that stuck out to me when I watched was that we were very linear, run, 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 you know, get fast. They were very much about direction change. And I started realizing, well, of course, baseball, tennis, yeah, yeah. You know, these, are, these are sports that are very, very dependent on your ability to move side to side. And then rotary power, I still remember he, he had the first med ball wall I'd ever seen. They had built a med ball wall. They had this huge concrete wall in their indoor facility where they threw medicine balls. And he was talking about, you know, rotary power and how much that enhanced hitting and how much it enhanced, you know, tennis. And I remember thinking, and, you know, myself, and, you know, at that time I was doing a lot of hockey. Wow. And how much it would help shooting. You know, these are all things that, yeah, yeah that, you know, that we, I mean, we'd probably thought about scratch the surface of, but I remember going back to our staff and saying, Hey, you know, we had a really good four days down at IPI and, you know, we got to, we're going to do some things different. And it's really funny because 
our whenever I was going to do something different, everybody panics like, "Why are we changing?" You know, we're <laughs> everything we do is so good, and and I was like, "Yeah, but you know, we're not perfect. We need the way to get better is to study people who are doing something. I want to study people who are having success." at a rate equal or better to the rate that we're having success at. Those are the people that I want to study. And then, you know, at the same time, I started getting into rehab. I met through Daryl Leto, I met Greg Cook. Yeah. And I started talking to Greg, you know, and again, I was like, wow, this guy's really smart. You know, I remember still reading, he, he wrote an article in, I'm going to say 90 something called functional training for the torso. And yeah, it was yeah, yeah. A diagonal patterning, chopping and lifting patterns. Yeah. I, remember, I think that's how it started too. Yeah. And I remember thinking, wow, this makes so much sense. You know, we're so sagittal. And I met, actually, I met Gary Gray at that time. And although I think Gary, Gary's gone a little off the grid on me in terms of, you know, Gary initially was a tremendous resource. And then I think it went too far. But just Gary was the, one of the first guys to really kind of bang this unilateral functional drum, you know, like saying, hey, wait a second. It makes no sense. You guys don't, you know, you guys that are on two feet all the time aren't getting it done. And by the time I met Gary, I had an athlete with knee problems, who was really struggling. And I went, I still remember, I went to Gary's first chain reaction seminar, and it was my first exposure to this idea of functional anatomy. And okay. I was sitting there thinking, you know, initially, the first 10 minutes were, this guy's crazy, like he's talking crazy. And then you kind of sat there and you were like, no, he's not, this makes perfect sense. The things that he's saying in terms of what the muscles actually do and sort of the difference between like dead person anatomy, live person anatomy. He didn't use that yeah, term yeah. at the time, but you know, he was showing, you know, machine based, Hey, you know, you, you're trying to rehab a knee doing leg extension, you know, and that's not what the muscle does. You know, that this never happened. You know, the muscle is working. All these muscles are working together as a group. When you put your foot on the floor, he was a guy, and again, Vern Gambetta was the guy who turned me on to Gary. And you know, these were all people like I was really lucky. I, you know, I met every foundational person because I tried to meet him. Don Chu. I just called Don Chu on the phone. I remember I, I read an article that he wrote and I thought I need to understand this article better. And I just got on the phone and I remember, I still remember it was in the NSCA journal and it said he was at Ather sports injury clinic in like, I have to get Castro Valley, California or something. And I just, at that time I called information 411. You know, I want the Ather Sports Injury Clinic in Castro Valley, California or whatever it was. They gave me the number. I called and I said, "Hey, I want to talk to Don Chu." And they were like, "Can I ask who's calling?" And I said, "Yeah, it's just Tom, it's Michael Boyle. He's a strength coach. In, I'm a strength coach in Boston." Don Chu got on the phone. And I still remember the question. He had been doing something. He called it a high hang clean. And I was like, "Don, what's high hang clean?" I'm reading this article about your training program. I've never heard this. So he explained, you know, working from a higher hang position, blah blah blah. But the point was and this is why I've tried to be reachable and why I do podcasts and do things like that, because whether it was Al Vermeil or Don Chu or Johnny Parker or so many of these sort of legendary characters in our field, they all had time for me when I was not who I am. Not. Yeah, I know. What you're, yeah, I want to try to have time for that next generation of people because I want to be in the same situation. I want to be like these guys. I look at them and, you know, they. They get mad at me now because they are probably a lot of those guys are approaching 70. I'm 60. And I always tell them all, oh, you know, you were my idol when I was younger. You know, they, <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, it's true. I looked it up. To Mark, I looked up to Don Chu. I looked up to Albert Meal. I looked up to Johnny Parker. I looked up to all these guys. And I guess for me, I was even, you know, Gary Gray. I was looking up to the right guys. That was and I think. And this goes back to the idea. I used to say, when people said, you know, what do you do better than other people? And I said, I filter better than other people. Yes. Yeah. I don't get caught up in the stupid BS. You know, the, none of those guys, if all the guys that I named, none of those guys were like macho BS, chest pounder, look how much weight I lift people. Yeah. They were all people. They were all about coaching and all about the people that they were training and very little about themselves. And so I think that was another really good lesson for me because I realized this is the kind of guy that I want to be. Like, I don't, you know, like yeah, I always laugh at people like, I don't care how I look. If you're going to judge me based on how I look, if you're going to judge the book by the cover, then you ain't ever reading the Mike Boyle book because, you know, I'm, I'm not the least bit physically impressive. I will not do anything that will physically impress you. Trust me. But you realize that that doesn't matter. So when you go into the doctor's office and be like, take your shirt off. You know, I want to see your arms. What do your abs look like? You'd be like, no, you'd be like, you know, you go to a lawyer. You, know, you don't look at the lawyer and say, you know, roll up your pants. Let me see your quads. You know, like, like, like our problems, 
our field, we're, we're just filled with, we're overpopulated with idiots. And people who, you know, they sort of want to worship at the altar of physical appearance and fake masculinity. Well, we're, we're so drawn out from the basic fundamentals of philosophy. I'm Greek, right? So I, I love and I still uh, read Plato and I, I, I start reading uh, Republic. And there's a, there's a conversation in with uh, Kefalo. She was a, a really important man in the back end. Uh, someone comes in uh, after the gym and he said, oh, you old guys here, they were like 40. <laughs> um, you don't train, you always sit and, and chat and you're trying to figure out about life. And Kefalos turns around and said, well, you know what? I prefer when I am um, start getting older to have this muscle trained so I can give you more things so you can have a better life than to start training things you can see but actually you mean nothing. And it's true. And I mean, I'm all, you know, again, I, you know, I think everybody should exercise and everybody should be in shape, but, but I don't, I mean, I'm at the point, I don't care what, you know, as I said, what you can lift or how you look or any of those things are so totally irrelevant to me. There's a big chapter in your book about uh, uh, analyzing the de demands of uh, a sport. And there's, you always said about that, but there's a, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago when you came out about agility. Yep. And, because everybody's now, I don't know why, why the trend is, is like, oh, we can train agility, the, uh, analyze the demands of the sport, and just try and repeating the same pattern. Is that something you do, something you like? Because I think training agility is a bit of a, I don't know. I think, I think it's a waste of time, to be honest. Thank you. It, because these people are doing that day, like you said, you work with tennis players. Yeah. Tennis players are going to spend hours changing direction. I think there are things, I think... You should teach people fundamentals of movement. I think people need to understand because good good movers sometimes don't know why they move well. Yeah. So I think when you get some elite level people, you can start talking about, about weight distribution and about angles and about a lot of these things. But I think what I found years ago, because this was back when I was a, you know, an American football strength coach back in the nineties, you know, we were always like, Oh, you know, we want to work on agility. And so we'd go out and set up cones and we'd tell people to run from cone to cone, whatever pattern, you know, side to side, star pattern, forward, back, what, you know, and then we'd time them. And when they didn't do it well, we'd basically tell them to try to do it faster and we'd time them again. And somehow we thought that was working on agility. And I looked at that and I thought, I don't know if that's really working on agility. I think it's working on maybe repeating the same mistakes over and over again, but it's probably not agility. The agile people will get lower times than the not agile people. Yeah. And one of the things I started to realize, at least in my own mind, was that, and I've said this numerous times, agility, quote unquote, if you want to call it agility, is about the process of being able to stop and change direction. If we think about stopping, stopping is an eccentric contraction, an isometric contraction, and a concentric contraction. And yep. people that are agile or fast or powerful or whatever, they have a better eccentric to concentric switching mechanism than people that are not agile. So I start looking at things like plyometrics and single leg strength, yep. things like that. I think that's essential to agility because when I'm thinking about agility, what I'm really thinking about is your ability to create your eccentric contraction, go rapidly through your isometric contraction and produce your concentric contraction. If you are not strong, you can't do that. Physics says you can't do it in the sense that body weight is X, speed is Y, X times Y equals momentum in this direction. That's just yeah. the way that it is. If you don't have the braking system, so you don't have enough unilateral strength, I can talk to you forever about foot plant, knee angle, whatever it is, and I'm not going to make you more agile unless I can increase that unilateral strength. strength. And a lot of cases, that unilateral eccentric strength. So you're, you know, that's why people say, you know, we stick our landings all the time in the beginning yeah. of our quote unquote. So our plyometrics, really, if you look, at, I always say this, and I had a little Twitter thing about this a couple of weeks ago. If you looked at our plyometric training for the first nine weeks, we are not doing climate. We are simply doing jumping drills and hopping drills and bounding drills. But that does not make those things unimportant. It just oh, means sure. there will be a time when we'll work on eccentric to concentric switching. But before you can work on eccentric to concentric switching, you need to have the eccentric ability. And, you know, that's the ability to stick that landing. And you need to have the strength to then reproduce that concentric contraction after you've gone through that decelerated period. So I just feel like with agility, a lot of times it's a waste where people are just, you're spinning your wheels. You're not going to get better or more agile by simply asking someone to do it faster. By far. And as I always say, strength is always money in the bank. Like being able to, depending on the sport, but 
for me is good movement and start to build up strength on that movement so you can be able to do whatever you want. Because then, and the difference is that's why, you know, you get into this whole functional training thing, but unilateral strength is what matters. Yeah. There's no, hockey is an interesting sport because there are some decelerated parts of change of direction that are bilateral, but in every other sport, it's, yeah, it's unilateral. So even, you know, this is the problem when you say to people, oh, you need to be really strong. And then someone ends up where they're, you know, they've got somebody on this powerlifting program and they're worried about how much they can squat. And you look and think, no, that's not really helping. And then you have to get into the whole unilateral idea of explaining to somebody about how the body works and the fact that the pelvis muscles and the core muscles, all these things work differently when you're in unilateral stance. And, and you can get into these, you know, incredibly long discussions slash arguments with these people because you realize they don't understand function. Yeah. And if you don't understand function, then you can just look at the very basic, oh no, just get really strong in a bilateral stance and that will transfer to everything. Is that how you came up with the joint by joint approach? Joint by joint really, no, came up and I have to do it because Dan John's been doing these, uh, I think he calls them conversations on a napkin. He's been posting. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. So, he I loves that. Joint by joint was beers, I think in Chicago, talking functional movement screen with Gray Cook and you know, I was talking about the fact that, you know, basically everybody who can't squat gets better when you raise their heels. I said, everybody, like if you get someone, you know, you get a squat, like you get someone that you try to squat, you're like, okay, that's not a three. Like, you know, if you looked at percentage wise, you know, the, the, the functional movement screen was designed around a bell curve. That's the whole idea is that we should have basically like, you know, maybe, maybe 10% threes, 10% ones, 80% in the middle on that bell curve. And we were talking about that. And I said, but Everybody on the curve, everybody in the 80% gets better when you block their heels up. Yeah. And, and I remember, and Gray said, he goes, yeah, he goes, it's just mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile, stable. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, your ankles need to be mobile, but your knee needs to be stable. He said, your hip needs to be mobile, but your lumbar spine needs to be stable. And I was like, I literally, and I've had, I've told this story a million times. I said to Gray, stop. And he's like, what, what, what do you mean? I, I, you can't say anything else. And I waved at the bartender. And I got a napkin from the bartender and I started writing on the napkin. Ankles mobile, knees stable, hips mobile, lumbar spine stable. I wrote out joint by joint on a napkin at the bar in this conversation. And then I, once I had it written down, I looked at Grace and said, okay, keep going. And we continued our conversation, but that kind of grew into this idea that, okay, basically we need to work on ankle mobility. We want that ankle to be mobile. If the ankle's mobile, if we have dorsiflexion, yeah. then be able to squat. But I need the knee to be stable. The knee's a hinge. And when we think about knee injuries, they are basically loss of stability. Yeah. Collateral tear, or, you know, ACL tear, those types of things. We destabilize the hinge, right? So we need that joint. And then when we think about, you know, hip, I always said, I wrote in the article, you know, hip mobility, the hip needs to be able to move yeah. into flexion and extension. Because if not, you're going to compensate from the back and then you're going to have... Independent of the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine needs to remain stable yeah. while the hip goes through its ranges of motion. You know, so it was one of those, it tied everything together for me that I had been thinking and reading all along. And it was like, oh, this makes so much sense. It was so easy, so simple. And, and it's funny because that is everywhere. That idea, everybody's book, everybody's presentation. But the bad yeah. part, I don't even get credit anymore for it half the time. I look at people and think, oh, you know, the joint by joint approach and they've got a picture of a skeleton, you know, with, with mobility, stability, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and I'm not, you know, I'm a forgotten afterthought in the whole process. But it's it funny because a couple of years uh, ago in my university, they were saying about Joan by Joan, it was a seminar. And I said, oh, it's uh, Mike Boyle. It's like, no. And I said, oh, that's Mike Boyle's foundation of the whole yep. aspect of. If you look up the article, Joint by Joint Approach to Training, I wrote it for T Nation of all places. Wow. Well, you know, probably, I don't know, 2010, 2008, something like that. And then What's... I tried to give Gray the credit because it, it really was Gray's idea. <laughs> I just synthesized yeah, you just put in, uh, uh, you, you made the map. Uh, in many cases, we've got intangible adaptations will be caused by changes in the, in the neuro aspect, the neurological aspect. How do you manage that? Do you use actually uh, nervous system stimulation? I mean, I think we always, like, if you look at all, I always, I wrote an article, because I always say I wrote an article, because I'm always writing articles. Yes, yes, yes. Called Power Cubed. And I said, you know, we're always doing power. So we're going to do, you know, if you look at what's plyometrics, body weight power exercises, right? What is Olympic lifting? Loaded, you know, so we broke it down into um, body weight power, heavy implement power, light implement power. 
So, you know, light implement power was medicine balls. Heavy implement power was, you know, whatever, Olympic lifts, kettlebell swings, jump squats, trap bar jump, all that would fall into heavy implement power. And then bodyweight power would be all of our plyometric progression. So, I mean, it, it really always comes down to the nervous system. Yeah. But you have to realize that the nervous system controls the muscular system. And some people, I said, like I always say, use the expression, he's got good wires. You know, if I look at that guy, I'm like, he's got really good wires. And sometimes you'll see people and think that guy doesn't have good muscles, but he's got really good wires. Like the wiring to his muscles is really, really good. So he doesn't even need big muscles because he's got really good wires. Whereas somebody with kind of inferior wires will generally benefit from larger muscles yeah. up to a point. And here, like I said, these are the problems that we run into as strength and conditioning coaches. Because I think that heavy bilateral lifting probably makes you less athletic as opposed to more. When you get beyond a certain point, because if you think... And I use the example, if you go to a powerlifting meet, people don't look very athletic. They yeah. don't move yeah. in a very athletic way. So you start to realize that eventually becoming this incredible, you know, force production machine in bilateral stance probably diminishes some other qualities. Yeah. And that's where, like, sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. Movement, mobility, you know, you want to, you need to have this, this animal that moves really, really well and moves powerfully and is supple. You know, I always think of like, yeah, Tony Hollow talks about feed the cats and cats are a really good demonstration. You know, whether you think about cheetahs or gazelles or they're, they're always lean. They're not, you know, blocky. Like if you look, power lifters to me are like the rhinoceros and the elephant. You know, they're yeah. going to be really good for certain things. You want to knock something down? <laughs> probably going to do a rhino. with a rhinoceros than you're going to do with a cat, with a lion. But, you know, if you want to hunt something down in the wild, you're probably going to do a lot better with a, a lion than you will with a rhino. And we've, like, we have to know at what point did we stop making the right thing. And, and that's, it's one of the fundamental failings of strength and conditioning is that we get to a certain point and then we don't want to stop. We have this built-in bias and suddenly you look and think, okay, this type of training is no longer benefiting this person. Yeah. I'm, and that's where we started moving, you know, this whole functional training idea was sort of built around the idea. Wait a second. Yeah, we, I mean, we all absolutely need basic bilateral strength. It's really important foundation. But we have to look at a certain point and think, okay, at what point am I now chasing these marginal gains just in specific lifts that require really a lot of time investment and probably have you know, I always look like I say to people, what's the orthopedic cost of that lift? <laughs> you know, you look and think some of those things have a very high orthopedic cost that an athlete or a general public person can't afford. I don't want to say the name. There was a really famous tennis player that had a hip uh, um, uh, surgery twice. And I was, you know... I watched the special on... Uh, oh, okay. And you're like, okay, something went wrong there. And it's exactly what you're uh, actually saying now about the orthopedic cost of specific training and specific ways. I'm not going to go through, okay, you know, you were born with it. But somebody uh, always says assess and don't guess. So you can have a better training strategy. I've got some questions from people that text me. I know you're really busy. Joseph is saying, have you always stuck to his gu uh, to your guns in terms of doing what you believe is right? Or have you been in a situation where you had to follow someone else's protocol on how to deal with that? I have always stuck to my guns. I've always taken the approach of Fire me. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not doing something that I don't believe in. I've been in a couple of situations where I thought I was going to lose jobs. Luckily for me, in one situation, the player bailed me out because the player really believed in me. And the player happened to be a really good, talented guy who had the ability to to dictate a little bit to management. And he said, I'm doing what Mike says I'm not doing. You know, I, I, I was in conflict with the physical therapist and the physical therapist said it should be done one way. And I said, I didn't believe that that was correct and that it should be done a different way. And I was, you know, I ended up in a meeting with the general manager and the physical therapist and the team doctor. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to walk out of here with one less job than I had yesterday. And I walked out with more control than I had the day before because The athlete stood up and said, he literally said, I don't care what you guys want me to do. He said, I am going to do what Mike tells, tells me to do. And he was like, if you fire him, I will just go where he is and train with him and do my rehab. And they all kind of looked at each other and were like, well, I guess we're going to let Mike do what he wants to do. But I was willing. I think you have to be willing. If you're not willing, um, you know, what do they say? If you don't stand for something, you won't stand for yeah. anything, right? Really? And, You know, I think you have to be able to go in and say, no, this is what I believe. But I will say once, you know, with the Red Sox, I had some players, pitchers, 
particularly who wanted to back squat. And I let them. You know, I started because I, I think you also have to be, there's some degree of flexibility that you have to have, particularly in professional sport. I remember looking at these guys and thinking, and these were like all-star level guys. They were really good players. And I thought, hey, this guy got here. I used to say, you all got here without me. You know, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I didn't help any of you get to Major League Baseball. I'm just trying to help you stay here. So if you believe that strongly, I'm going to tell you I don't like it. I'm going to tell you I don't think you should do it. But I'm not also going to tell you that you can't do it. So so I guess there have been times in really select situations where I let somebody do something I didn't really believe in. I had that chance actually uh, four months ago. I treated him um, and trained him for three days. Then his uh, physio came and said, oh, we need going to do things this way. And I said, oh, if we do things this way, the it's going to go really bad. And because there are managers, you know, teams behind and from people and docs. And I said, I'm walking out because uh, it's what you said. I stand for what I believe in. Yeah, I watched the hip thing that you were talking about, the test play. I watched that whole special and I thought they let him do things. He should never have been working with pain. Thank you, coach, because now I feel a bit better. That would have been my, my primary number one thing was that this is a mistake. He's trying to work through something and it's yeah. not going to work. And his body was talking and nobody would listen. Yeah. No, especially, well, not him. And I think sometimes I always say our job at certain points in time is to protect the athlete from themselves. Yeah. And sometimes that can be difficult. Sometimes that can create conflict. But you need to realize that that's part of your job. Part of your job is saying this is not in your – and I've said it, I've done it a lot. Like I've done just – extensive amounts of rehab and i always tell the athletes like there's only one way this is going to go and you're going to do what i want you to do if you don't want to do what i want you to do then I'm out. you need yeah you need to find somebody else to do it because We're i'm not, not clowns yeah no and i said i'm not going to sit here and you know watch you ruin your career you want to go do that go do it someplace else alex says uh have you worked with el el elderly and would you uh, want to construct a core access program for someone that's wheelchair bound? Um, we have not. We have actually, we have one great wheelchair bound guy, James Norris, who trains at our facility, which I mean, I never thought we'd have anybody like that, but James is awesome. If you could, I mean, we look at handy capable fitness and you'll see things that will just astound you. I won't say, I mean, it's just, it's never been my demographic. I don't, you know, I, I mean, I work, I guess it depends on how you define elderly too, in terms of I guess my 70 year old client is elderly at this stage yeah. of the game in terms of if we're looking strictly based on chronology. Mm -hmm. uh, now, whatever, a septuagenarian, I guess, is the, uh, the correct. 70 year old is young. Yeah. And that's what I mean. So I, I guess, and we have a lot of clients. I, we have a lot in their 70s, a few in their 80s. Everybody's really, really functional and gets around really well. I, my whole thing is I want to work with anybody who wants to enhance the quality of their life. But what I do more now, I work with coaches more than I work with athletes. I have one or two groups. I train my son and his friends. I train, you know, my daughter and her friends. I train some of our professional athletes. But more of my energy is going into training coaches than it is going into training people. Okay. Uh, when performing the 1990 stretch, is there, is there a pressure and a little pain in the front of the knee uh, plus tibial external rotation? What would you do to handle it? Not do it. <laughs> That's what I, I replied. I wrote, so, I mean, my does it hurt? Pain. My does it hurt is the best article I ever wrote. Yeah. And it's really, really simple. If it hurts, don't do it. There's no, like, your body is really, really good at telling you what it can and can't do. And your body is really good. It will adapt over time. And if you, if you apply the correct loading over the correct period of time, you'll get the tissue adaptation that you want. But the body saying, someone saying that hurts means for whatever reason, usually a lack of strength, but in like a 90-90 type stretch, it's probably a lack of hip mobility that's making their knee hurt. And you look and think, okay, you don't have the requisite hip mobility. The other thing I might, so we use these uh, flex cushions that we get from um, Japan. A guy named Nao Sakata developed this flex cushion for sumo wrestlers for stretching. And it's basically a big wedge. But again, if I had someone with pain, probably the first thing I would do is try a wedge and, you know, put a wedge under their knee so that we can yeah. do that a little bit. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, yeah. End up in a situation where that relieved the pain, then okay. You stay with the wedge. If you still got pain with the wedge, we're going to find another stretch for hip that won't put you in that same type of position. Two questions. What do you consider about total volume uh, sets per week per movement muscle group? Is it an important factor for you programming for athletes? And does it? how do you integrate your programs? Our total volume, we are generally, I would say we are low volume people to begin with. So, um, you know, we don't, I never, ever, ever, pursue volume. Our high volume for us 
would be 30 repetitions of an exercise. In that 30 repetitions, maybe 20 would be, you know, aggressive loading. So a high volume workout in any particular exercise, or, you know, like a high volume, whatever, you know, split squat workout would really be 20 reps. So okay. we keep volume very, very low. I think volume, again, I think we've been, this could be another whole podcast, but I think we've been very um, deceived by the steroid world. And, and so we have this conception of volume. I like the idea of minimal effective dose. What's the least I can do to get the outcome that I want? Most, yeah. You know, and so I look at that. If that's one set, great. We'll do one set. If, I, if we do one set and you're getting stronger, I'm fine doing one set. If we feel like, oh, we need two sets for you to get stronger. Because the thing that happens, again, from a volume standpoint, a lot of times volume is based on how much warm-up do you need to be comfortable with the heaviest weight you're going to lift. That may, you know, because some people, you know, there's a big difference between squatting, like we use back squat, conventional back squat. There's a yep. big difference between five sets of five at 400 and doing 135 for five, 225 for five, 315 for five, and 400 for five. Some people might say, oh, I did four sets of five. I would look at that and say you did one. Yeah, yeah, four. yeah. So I think you also have to look at how you're calculating volume. And, you know, if you look at sort of the old powerlifting, Olympic lifting idea, you could go back to this and think, um, you know, rep, you know, you want to count reps above 70%, you want to count reps above 80%, whatever it is, you know, but I just think you have to, I think you should always be careful with volume. You should always realize that volume is generally going to get you in trouble as opposed to help you. And again, people that are worrying about volume usually are coming from the Olympic lifting, powerlifting world, and they're trying to train athletes. Yeah. Whereas people like us, we never, I mean, like I said, behind 30 reps, man, we, we kill that exercise if we did 30 reps of that exercise. But it's also what you said about PEDS, which is people are, are don't know exactly what's happening in the background, so they see or they're following people that are on. You have to be really careful looking at bodybuilding or powerlifting or Olympic lifting and trying to, trying to bring information back into fitness or athletic training. You've got to be very, very careful because there's a real good chance that it's going to blow up in your face. Last question, uh, that's for me, because I get, sometimes I get blamed because I, I, I'm a person that says posture p plays a big role in all day living plus training. And you've got uh, people that are saying posture is just uh, not that important. Uh, what's your take? I think posture is hugely important. You know, if you look at people that are seated all the time, have more people, more problems than people that stand. There's no question. I mean, you can look at that. I, I, you know, and a guy, I don't know necessarily if there is data that supports that but i will tell you that we see that all the time sitting is a problem and sitting is a posture of flexion right you know it's it's trunk flexion it's hip flexion it's you know you get into sort of the whole yanda myers you know long short idea you know you get you know muscles that are locked long muscles that are locked short you get muscles that are tight you get muscles that are weak all that stuff happens we know that to say that posture is not important i think The people who say that stuff to me are people looking to be controversial. Yeah. And I, and I often, one of the things I often talk about with people is I want to know the people who are, when you're saying something like that, the big question I have is what do you do every day? Because the amazing thing that I find is that a lot of the people who are talking a lot on the internet and writing a lot aren't really doing a lot. That's what Stu says all They're the time. very interested in, okay, does this person have a history of training people. And it's amazing. Most of the people who talk about this stuff, you know, you go to their Instagram, whatever you go back and look one, either their Instagram is private or all the videos are of them. Yeah. And you can think like, well, where are the videos of the people that you're training? Where are, where is the common man that you're telling me about and how much time, you know, how many hours a week do you spend with those people? And then you find when, you know, I always think like, it's like, Hey, scratch back, get down a few layers on some of these people. And one thing you're going to realize, We have a huge amount of frauds in our industry, a huge amount of people who make their living by telling other people how to do things that they don't do. Thank you, coach. Thank you. Three books that you would recommend me? Three books that I would recommend you. I always ask that question. Hmm. That, Dan gave me 10. <laughs> yeah, Dan gave you 10. Well, one, I, you know, I'd, I'd go with like my, my basic how to win friends and influence people uh, is one of the best books ever written. If you haven't read that one, you need to read right. that. Is that Dale, uh, Carnegie Dale Carnegie? 
yeah, it, yeah. It's, a, it's probably 1940s era. Yeah. Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, really, really good. Somebody like you, who's obviously bright and working, I, uh, never, never Eat Alone. If you haven't read ne Never Eat Alone, that's a great book. I would call Never Eat, never eat Alone, I'd call the sort of how to win friends and influence people for um, the, the, you know, the 2000s decade. Uh, I've got, like I said, Daniel, Dan said, give you 10. I could probably give you 20. I love, Most Likely to Succeed was my favorite book of the, the recent past. Um, Think Like a Freak was unbelievable. I loved, you know, if you've never read Think Like a Freak, I have, you know. Think Like a Freak. Um, when we talk about coaching, The One Thing was yeah, an outstanding book. Really um, good book. Yeah, it made me, you know, focus on coaching my coaches more because I realized that's my one thing is coaching coaches. Um, so one thing was good. Oh, God. Um, you win in the locker room first if you're working with athletes. I loved that book. That's a John Gordon book. I'm just trying to think of, you know, the, the ones that yeah, I really loved um, Sports Gene. I finished I had Sports Gene. I was a little late to the party on. Um, but I read that last year and, and it was also very read range. I think, uh, which was really, really good book about because we used to train athletes. Yeah. Range. I have about 20 pages in range left right now. And I thought range was really good, but I will say I like sports scene better than range. Okay. Uh, I love the genius in all of us. Shank genius in all of us of all the books, like, you know, uh, outliers, talent code. those were all really good books. The best of that series of books was genius in all of us which I really, really enjoyed. So there's a whole, I, I probably went over 10, so. Perfect. Coach Boyle, thank you so much for your time. Rocco, thank you very much for doing it. I appreciate it. I'm going to go and uh, make myself some lunch because it's lunchtime here in the good old US of A. <laughs> Perfect, and I hope I'll meet you soon in person. Yes, please, come come to Boston. I will, I, will, I promise. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.